And I lived in when I was, it's about three years ago, I got a telephone call from Johannesburg from someone whose name I, I simply couldn't, uh, haven't heard before, to be quite frank, and he asked whether he come and see me about uh, a certain history book he's writing. And I said, well, I uh, I'm actually, you know, I left university uh, teaching 15 years before and uh, I don't really um, fully equipped to give him much assistance, and uh, but he insisted, and the, and he came down, and I think it was the beginning of I would just I would call it the friendship that he uh, we exchanged views about the book. He told me about his old story just to give a background, and he explained that uh, by saying, you know, he he can't speak Afrikaans, but of course he grew up in the Transkei, which is a perfectly legitimate excuse, I think. <laughs> and uh, his father was a clerk in the in the in the legal office. His mother was a nurse. Is that correct? Yes. And he studied at Tumtata, and uh, he then got the, got the chance to go to the University of Transkei, and he from there he got a, a was it the LSE in in, in London and L, uh, London School of Economics. And he started getting interested in this and he started finding documents that we then uh, was never consulted in South Africa. And for the first time, and I did, it hasn't been done, this book places South Africa in the setting of Africa and uh, in the setting of blacks yearning and campaigning and fighting for human rights. And that is the great, uh, the great uh, uh, contribution that the book makes. Uh, and uh, I, I, we corresponded about it, and uh, I, uh, I was, uh, I say, I was very surprised after our first meeting. I still couldn't be left after we had about three hours of discussion and left. And that evening, I put on the television, and suddenly on the television is somebody that was my guest earlier today, <laughs> and it is uh, Tembika appearing for the EFF. In the, in, the, in, the, in the court case against Jacob Zuma. So, that doesn't mean he's EFF. It's, uh, it's just that Julius happens to think he is the smartest lawyer in Johannesburg, and uh, I think it's, uh, Julius has got some good judgments too. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I was, I was, uh, that, uh, I, I, I was a very happy association. I must say, this is what we. Certainly, I think all of us here in South Africa is this conversation between whites and blacks to start. You know, it's usually we 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 shout at each other or we talk past at each other. We don't really communicate. We don't exchange. We don't. Uh, there's no meeting of the minds. And I think your book helps a lot to uh, to, to to give the setting in which blacks try to find a place as South Africans, not as a category of subordinate people, but as blacks as South Africans, so they fought for human rights. And then, of course, you've got the best title, uh, even better than Jack Poe, I would say, you know. <laughs> uh, it is an excellent title. Uh, uh, I hope it's not of, uh, the la your last visit to Stellenbosch. I think it's a great yearning uh, for the uh, views of your views to be, to be discussed here and to, be, uh, to have. And what a lovely term that we have in Afrikaans. The open the open conversation. It's not a conversation set in specific uh, limits and walls and so on, but it's it's open, you know, and uh, that that is what we all of us yearn for in South Africa. Um, Albert is actually Albert Grenling is actually the expert on this, and I feel myself very much playing in the in the second reserve league where Western Province soon will be. Uh, um, <laughs> Albert did his doctorate on, or his, his MA on, 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 MA and his doctorate on two very interesting themes. The first theme is, on, it was a very risky theme at that time when he wrote it as an MA student, was on the headsoppers and the joiners in the anglo boer War. And that was even before all the names were known. I think a few years later, in the second edition of the book, the name of the joiners and the and the heads of us, uh, were, pu were published uh, to the chagrin of some of the families. But in any case, <laughs> <laughs> well, they learned to duck very soon. <laughs> now, Albert, uh, then the second book was about uh, uh, the the black, the black participation in the in the First World War, the black soldiers in the, in the First World War. <coughs> 
And there he uh, was uh, courageous enough to uh, tackle some myths and so on. And, uh, but we, the, the conversation tonight is not about that. But I'm very glad that we have the opportunity this morning, uh, this, this evening, to uh, talk about uh, Tim Baker's book. And since Albert knows much more about it than I do, although I have know a bit about the eastern part, the eastern frontier part of it, a bit of the Transkei part, I would like to have the first uh, leave the first questions to Albert, and I'll come in a little bit later. Okay, Albert. Yeah, I just wish to congratulate you on what I found a succinct and compelling read with an aspect on which focuses on South African history, which certainly deserves that kind of sustained attention. I can only think of one other comparable book dealing with law and politics, and that's by an American, Richard Abel, with a title, Politics by Other Means. And it dealt with the 1980-1994 anti-apartheid struggles and the law. Um, and, and the way the law was used politically. Yours, of course, deals mainly with an earlier period. Now, I want to start off by the talking to you a bit about the 1913 Land Act, which is so central in this country. Now, it's uh, rightly notorious for its restrictions on land ownership and it was heartless in its eviction of squatters in the Free State. But, and I'd like to have your opinion on this, I think we should also guard as seeing this as a kind of synodoc, as the impact of the Act was uneven. In the Cape Province, as we know, land ownership was tied to the qualified franchise and hence it would have been unconstitutional to have it implemented. Uh, perhaps you would care to, to comment on this. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it depends. I mean, where one, one starts with the 1930 Land Act. And my book, as you point out, is about black responses uh, to the various manifestations of the extension of empire. The very notion of law itself came to black people as an incident of empire. It, was, it didn't come as a, a neutral idea of resolving uh, disputes, but it was tied to the conception of empire. How will the British Empire rule the world? And it came after the war. And that is the starting point. So, of course, the consolidation of empire, and that is my critique of the 1913 Land Act, and so it starts. The consolidation of empire is most visible after 1910 with the establishment of the Union. And the 1913 Land Act comes three years after. But let's look at what South Africa was like in 1913. In the Cape, which is why the impact of the 1913 Land Act was not the same as Natal, Eastern Transvaal, and the Free State. The story of the land was effectively over by the end of the 19th century, completely over. The last phase of the contest, military contest, is 1878. The war, that is what the cross was called, the war, which is the last frontier war. The impact of that was quite significant in relation to its disruptive uh, effect because it finally pushed the Trussels at the instigation of the British across the Kai. So if you went to the Eastern Cape by 1913 and you tried to find a split of the land, it would be so clear that the western part of the Eastern Cape is Dutch or stroke Boer or British but the political control was British political control. So the, the first explanation why in the Eastern Cape the impact of the 1930 Land Act was not as severe in relation to physical dispossessions and physical evictions is that that story became irrelevant in the Eastern Cape. And, where, and hence the various political leaders, in the black political leaders in the Eastern Cape actually didn't care about the act. In fact, one of them expressed support behind the act. 
Because what he felt was that, at the very least, what the act would do is to consolidate native ownership in relation to the native reserves. But in the Transvaal, the story, Eastern Transvaal, the story was different, the same as in the uh, uh, Free State. Because there, the story of occupation of land by black people was not as finer as in the Eastern Cape. And hence, the early writings from a, an African perspective, by Saul Plache, and one of the authors, that are, one of the lawyers that I deal with, which is uh, uh, Richard Simak, tend to focus on Natal, Transvaal, and the Free State because there the disruptive effects were experienced. In other words, people were physically dislocated and removed from the properties that they occupied. So it is true that the impact of the act was uneven, but I, I think that it was uneven because of what had transpired before the act was implemented. Yes, um, about the evictions, I recently came across your man, uh, Richard Misamang, that uh, where he, in a newspaper article, he actually explained what would happen to some of these ev people that had been evicted. Some of them moved to Lesotho, he said, and others to, to Botswana. Uh, so, and, and, and there were also, strangely enough, some attempts by commissioners to have them relocated or resettled at other farms. Uh, would you like to comment on that? Or? Yes. Um, I mean, it's probably at the heart of the story because the book, in part, deals with the, how these African lawyers of this era responded to the Native Land Act of 1930. So, if I can tell, just tell you a brief history, I mean, you've read the book clearly, uh, but if I can just tell you a brief history about who Richard Msima was. So, he comes from a place in today's KwaZulu Natal, and at the time it was Natal called Edendale. And this was lo located to them uh, because of a relationship that they had with another man from the Eastern Cape called um, uh, uh, Sir George Gray. And they were among the first natives to accept Christianity. And they became known as Amakolo, and those were Christian converts. And Amakolo were generally regarded with a little bit of suspicion by the local native population because the resistance against colonialism was military resistance, and those people that accepted Christianity were regarded effectively as sellouts. So he comes from his grandfather, who was one of the first Christian converts. And that entire area of Edendale was occupied by these Christian converts. The irony, of course, with the entire story is that these first Christian converts then became the very first people to acquire education because that was part and parcel of what was called civilization. But because they were the first to acquire education, they were the first to have opportunities to study abroad. So in Richard Msimang's story, he travels from Natal, ultimately ends up in the Eastern Cape, which at the time was the crucible of missionary education at a school called Hilltown. At that school, he then has this dream of pursuing his studies. And his father puts him in touch with another Methodist school in England, at, which was called Queen's College in uh, Taunton, uh, Som uh, Somerset. So he eventually then spends nine years in Natal and becomes hugely popular as a soccer player, but most importantly, as a rugby player. And he actually plays rugby, ultimately becoming the vice captain of the team. Town 11, uh, Town 15, that's what it was called. And uh, he was a fly half. Interesting story, uh, which I didn't touch upon in the book, but is that the South African team, I think, visited London in 1913 or 1912. 19, uh, 12. 1912, yes. They went to play in Somerset and they played against. Town uh, 15. A couple of months after Simon had come back to South Africa. Imagine the story if they had played against them when he was there. Most remarkable story.
Anyway, he spent nine years in, uh, in England. He qualified as a lawyer. He did his articles. When he came back, he was, of course, now Richard Msimang, LLB, uh, barrister, not a barrister, uh, attorney at law. One of the first assignments he was then given when he came to South Africa, because he was compelled to join the ANC, he didn't want to join the ANC originally, he wanted just to be a lawyer, but his brother, Henry Simang, was already quite active as a clerk to another black lawyer that had registered at the time, Pixley Guy Zagasen, and he eventually then joins up the law firm, and, but he splits within a couple of months to open his own firm. But they ask him to go around the country recording the stories of the impact of the 1913 Land Act. So unlike other authors, I don't look at the impact of that act through the prism of Sol Plagi, but I look at it through the prism of Richard Msimang. What did he see was happening in the provinces that he visited? Well, it was at the time the colony uh, that he visited. Is utter desperation as a consequence of the implications of this act. But he also sees another category emerging. And this is now the category of sharecroppers. Now, sharecroppers, I mean, there's a book by Charles Van Onselen dealing with a particular sharecropper called uh, uh, Maine. But what he then sees is that the impact of the act, and this is an insight that before I read his writings, I had not been aware of. He says, most people look at this act as the point at which land was dispossessed from African people. But he says, no, of course the act consolidates dispossession that pre-existed it. The true impact of the act was threefold. I think I deal with it somewhere in one of the chapters. He says the first thing that happened is that those people that suddenly found the hectareage of land that they used to occupy restricted, had to give up property, cattle. And then he says because there was no proper way of disposing of those cattle, because there could be no proper sales, those cattle ended up being taken by the new owners. I, I teased Herman about that and said, you guys, we talk about Nguni cattle. Do you know how you got those Nguni cattle? <laughs> <laughs> So he, he focuses on the loss of cattle as a critical consequence of the 1913 Land Act. The second point that he complains about is what he calls conditions of slavery. Because he says once the land was then taken by the new owners, the problem was that they needed people to work the land. And hence the emergence of this category called uh, 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 rent laborers. How that comes about is because there is now these vast pieces of land but no one to work on them. And those people who continued living on the land could continue staying on the land but on condition that they would work for the new owners of the land and they were not paid any rental. And he goes family by family asking them about the con conditions under which they continue living on the land. So he says you've lost your cattle but you've also become slaves, in effect. So I, I said to Herman, how did these people police it? And then I think you said it was through the past system. <laughs> so, <laughs> but it's so true, because it is also the discovery of Msima that the only way to restrict these workers to continue living in the farms was the imposition of the past system. So we also see now the linkage between the past system and labor. And uh, that, of course, also happened in Natal. So it wasn't only a free state phenomenon, but also in Natal. Uh, we're getting back to the free state, and, and I think one should relate that to the kind of local politics, white politics of the time as well. Uh, that there, there, there's a school of thought that like to argue that uh, this was a sop to Herzog uh, for the farmers that Herzog has been kicked out of the, out of the cabinet. Everyone knows more about it than I do, I think. But, uh, and that this was then an attempt to say that uh, although you've been kicked out of the, uh, out of the, uh, the cabinet, we'll um, pacify your followers through the Land Act. Uh, 
Yes, I mean, there is, of course, the larger, you know, uh, Afrikaans or Africana political story uh, which implicates Herzog. But can I answer the, the question differently by posing a, uh, a, a counter position? So Herman and another colleague of his at UCT, Rick Elfik, so they write this fascinating book called The Shaping of South Africa. In, when did you write it? In the 60s or in the 70s? Or in the 80s? No, in the book first. Yes. And now my critique about the book is its focus on the contest between the British and the Boers as the protagonists towards the formation of South Africa and trying to locate a third protagonist which is blacks in a particular setting and trying to put them into the heart of the formation of South Africa. So I deliberately read the story of Herzog, but I deliberately didn't want to write about it. Because my point is to locate African thought, intellectual thought, into the story of the formation of South Africa. So in a sense, it's true that I'm retracing the history, but I'm also involved consciously in a project of rewriting the historical narrative. Okay. Um, but what uh, we know history. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I, I think you you singled out the heart of what you're trying to do there. Um, but the heart of it actually, as I read to understand the book, is the black middle class, the aspiring black middle class, which otherwise called the petty bourgeoisie, a tiny sliver of people at the time. And now. And, and that struck me again by having read what you say about their position and the kind of obstacles they, they were up against and also the kind of successes they tried to achieve. Now, at the, at the essence of this is that they were aspiring upwards, but uh, they also identified downwards with the fears and the frustrations of the black working class up to a point. Now, now, now I, I can't help thinking if one thinks about uh, how frustrated they must have been and they were also open to abuse uh, and it struck me how many of these people because of the kind, and I assume that, I can't really prove that, but under the pressures that they had to survive and endure that they took to drink and that was quite a common phenomenon. Um, yeah, and look, that's that is true. And I mean, I've heard some, you know, uh, when I wrote uh, the part about, I actually discovered it quite late in the in the process because I wanted to know what what happened at the end of their stories because they sort of vanish, you know. Uh, so you see this promising uh, African lawyer of 1920, and then you don't see him in the newspapers in the next five years, and so you wonder what happened, what became the end. So I tell you the two stories um, that were truly heartbreaking. The one story was uh, uh, Alfred Mangan. I mean, most of them actually, they all end up and uh, that's why I had to go back um, to, uh, to try and find out what happened towards the end of their lives. So take Mangana's story. He is probably by far uh, the most a forceful thinker and probably the most original thinker of all of the people that I have written about. And he had probably the most ambitious vision about South Africa. I mean, look at the article that he wrote in 1907 as a response to Bambata, uh, the Bambata uprising, which uh, people call Bambata rebellion. It's actually an uprising. But he then says, we don't want to swamp the white men in Africa. What we want is justice. So already in 1907, he was thinking about a system based on the rule of law, on the Bill of Rights, on equality, imagining what a new country might look like outside of the constraints of empire. What happens later in his life, he is sued across by his clients, he doesn't do his work, he, the law society wants to strike him off the roll, 
his wife ultimately leaves him, he ends up abandoning the legal practice and living in the Eastern Cape as a cattle dipper. And when he ultimately dies, he looks back at his own life and he's asking himself the question whether this was worth it. Whether the choice that he made is that he should not focus on law, but should focus on the broader structural problems that were facing South Africa, whether this was all worth it. And he ultimately dies without having answered this question for himself. The same point we can be made about Richard Msimang. Again, someone I at some point became friendly with as I was writing his story. I wanted to know what happens next. And you will see at the beginning of the chapter on Msimang, I make the contrast with Anton Chekhov, who in one of his novels, you know, says, what happens in our thirties? You know, why do we throw it away? Msimang ultimately takes to drink. He has a big fight with his wife, who ultimately leaves him. He ends up losing his properties. And he also dies a poor man. If you go to the uh, archives and you go through to find out what happened to his estate, if you look at his estate file, there is absolutely not a single asset registered in his name. In fact, his wife becomes desperate, uh, Grace um, Simon. She becomes desperate, writing to uh, his fa her father-in-law and writing to her brother-in-law, asking if there is any pieces of property or assets that were left behind. So I think the personal cost to these individuals was enormous because they were struggling these two worlds. There is the first world which was envisaged by Cecil John Rhodes, which is equality for all civilized men south of the Zambezi. And they said, but we've now achieved civilization in the sense that we've got education, property, and Christianity. And yet we are still not equal uh, to, to the white people. But at the same time, there are these pressures coming from below. I think what, what always struck me was the kind of, and I want a lot of empathy with this situation, but there was almost a kind of naive belief in, in the kind of promises of the British. Yes, I mean, this is the heart of the problem, isn't it? In 1900, uh, 1899 to 1901 was the war. But in 1900, there was a specific meeting where the British promised the Africans that if the British win the war, they would extend native franchise across the country, beyond the Cape. The war, of course, is over by 1901. But in the Treaty of Ferienachem, what is consolidated is white hegemony. And the promises that were made by the British, who actually supported the uh, natives, I mean, who were supported by the natives in the war, are totally abandoned. The same story repeats itself in Bambata. In the Bambata rebellion, and this story again, I mean, even in 1879, Anglo-Zulu War, same promise was made. The same story in Bambata. The natives that had accepted Christianity, Amakolo, fought against other black people on the side of the British, again with the same promise. Again in 1909, at that point, the concepts of the Treaty of Perienachem were being put into operation. The country was now going to be formed. A delegation is sent by the South African Native uh, Congress to London. They have a big discussion there. They are again promised that your concerns will be looked after and go back and we will uh, ensure that you achieve native franchise. In 1913, when the Land Act was being discussed, again there is another delegation in 1912 that goes to the uh, British Parliament. It makes the representations. When the 1914 uh, First World War broke, there was a big debate within native intellectuals, black intellectuals, thinking about whether or not to support Germany or the British. They ultimately supported the British on the same promise that there would be native franchise. They ultimately gave up in 1943 
episode after episode, going back to the same promise, to the same promise. In 1943, Alfred Kuma, another major African intellectual, was not a lawyer, but a doctor, who I actually credit with the vision of the Bill of Rights, as opposed to, the, to these lawyers. Alfred Kuma eventually says to these guys at the conference, that we have been through this for 25 years. It is not going to work. And so it's true that there was a belief that the British would live through according to their promise. It's most fascinating this because if you look at someone like Seme, Seme asked why am I equal when I'm in London but not when I'm in South Africa? Yeah. Um... I want to continue that line of thought, but in somewhat more critical fashion, perhaps. As I mentioned, we, one talks here about a very tiny portion, sliver, of the population. Now, in doing so, I think at times one may just run the risk of, not deliberately, but just through the way in which one goes about the narrative, of uh, not sufficiently incorporating the views and perceptions of a large swath of proletarians and peasants. Now there's one guy I want to single out because he carries my first name, Albert. Albert Nuzulu of Ruval. And I know the Ruval area because I had family there. And um, they, um, Albert went to... Um, uh, he, uh, he, he went to um, uh, Moscow and uh, in 1933 he wrote about the outbreak of the war and he stated it was the first betrayal of the struggle by the chiefs and petty bourgeois native good boys as he called them as they prefer to work within the system now there, 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 there is a sense and it's always difficult to capture because this is an isolated example, but there, there is a way in which one must surely try and, and capture what happened in the countryside among so-called ordinary people and, and in the cities, just to give it a more rounded historical view. Then also on the question of wider views, I think one can probably also look at the Industrial and Commercial Workers Union, which, uh, by, uh, which Clement Kadali was the uh, the leader of that, and, and which gave it a much a radical, more radical edge in the 1920s than the ANC had. had. No, I agree with that, I mean, fully. The, the paradox of the ANC, I mean, again, is, you, so you start off in 1913, and you, 1912 rather, when they established the ANC, and so you go to that conference and you look who, whose views are represented here. Because, of course, Sammy was a strong believer in the ideas that were propounded earlier, the American ideas that sort of tried to link the views of the elites with the views of the masses. So how did they draw this connection between themselves and the masses? One of the big debates in 1912 in the ANC was the role of the chiefs and their representation, whether they should be represented at all Ultimately, that dispute was resolved on the basis that the chiefs must be represented. Why? Because Seme argued, and I start with that in the Seme chapter, Seme argued that it is not the chiefs that are being represented, but it is the subjects of the chiefs. So from the get-go, the ANC usually gets a criticism about elitism, but that criticism overlooks the insight that Seme used to justify the representation of the chiefs. In fact, since you are provoking me, I must go to the book. Uh, we do that as lawyers. We like <laughs> <laughs> um, let's look at you know what we argue about uh, Seme at the beginning. So, so that's the first point about. Um, Yes. Yeah, but it didn't quite turn out that way. No. No, eventually it didn't because the chiefs represented themselves and not the subjects. Mm. But the middle classes always sell out, don't they? Mm. 
<laughs> so, so the justification that Sema gave about the representation of the chiefs, I mean, what eventually happened is that even the House of Chiefs was abolished by Tuma, because Tuma then saw that actually what the chiefs had done, the chiefs moved much closer in the heads of years. They moved much closer to the government, because the government was trying to create a wedge between the chiefs and the what Sema called the Parliament of the People. And it was because of that wedge and the fact that there were now increasing benefits being extended to the chiefs that Thomas said we must simply abolish this house because it's not reflective of the people. Thanks, yeah. Um, and just two brief comments on people which I found intriguing in your narrative. And uh, that one, uh, one of them was Anton Lembede. Uh, partly because he also read the Volksblatt. And, uh, and uh, there, there, there are historians who say that he picked up ideas about Afrikaner nationalism and that, he, and that he, he thought this, one may even say that he thought about employing that in terms of his analysis of African nationalism. Um, and, well, that's just an aside, but, but perhaps you comment on that. And then more important, uh, A.B. Guma. I think I agree with you there. I think he's a much underrated figure in general, and and I often I can't understand why he's almost been airbrushed out of the ANC pantheon of heroes. Zuma with the X, not with the Z. Guma. Yeah, no, no, no. Guma. Guma. Yeah. Yeah, it is closer to Zuma, but yeah. with, with an X, and he was from the Eastern Cape, not from Natal. Uh, he um, was a medical yeah. yeah, he was a medical doctor. I mean, I agree with the. In fact, I found this quote in uh, in a collection of um, of speeches by Lembed, where he expressly talks about African nationalism. I mean, there was a point. I mean, you will know this as a well. He will know as an African historian. But there was a point at which Africaners saw themselves as a, an occupied and a colonized people. And so they, they saw the establishment of the African identity as an anti-imperial project. Yeah. So, and we see this, I mean, I see it certainly in the writings also of, of Herzog, someone I tried to actually follow and understand. And I see that he has an outwardly anti-imperial um, conception about his entire framework. So, Lembede specifically refers to African nationalism as an anti-colonial project. And then he says there is no reason why we as Africans cannot borrow from uh, African nationalism in its anti-imperial form. The problem, of course, with African nationalism was its racism. I mean, that, this is the problem. And that racism was then consolidated in 1948. And then it simply became another form of imperialism. And it lost its uh, anti-colonial character. But I digress. Um, we, let's go to Kuma. Kuma, I actually think, I mean, I dedicated chapter 8 uh, to Kuma's ideas. Because we truly underestimate him in South Africa. Why? There are two books. Uh, both of which are biographies about Mandela. Mandela was very critical of Tuma because they always regarded Tuma as an elite who had no common touch with the people. That was because Mandela and his friends had tried to speak to Tuma about the establishment of the ANC Youth League. Tuma refused. He told them that he could give them a space to operate, but they shouldn't come with these ideas of radicalism within the ANC because these ideas had no place in the ANC of the time. And so over time, over the years, Puma has become a sort of an object of hate. Okay, now that we've, we've had this past president, then it's, yeah. Uh, so, so I begin that chapter by saying of all past presidents of the ANC, there are very few that are as maligned as Puma. So he has always been maligned by the Mandela generation the Sasulu generation and the Tambu generation. The consequence is that we have forgotten about his ideas, but he was a true intellectual, because if you look at his contribution towards the creation of the Bill of Rights and his contribution towards an internationalist perspective of the ANC, 
And his reforms of the ANC itself, firstly, he killed the uh, House of Traditional Leaders. Secondly, he fixed the finances. The ANC was in a total financial mess. He fixed the finances of the ANC. And secondly, he actually made people to acquire property. Yeah, I can only agree with you there. Um, when he took over from Sami, it's unbelievable to that. To, uh, one has got to remind yourself that actually happened. The ANC consisted of 150 people of, of uh, subscribed members. And uh, he, he managed to resurrect the ANC. He was a medical doctor, a gynecologist. He studied in Hungary and in, in the UK. Um, but what also aided him was urbanization during the Second World War. In, in that it became easier to organize people if they lived in one, one so-called location, in one geographical location. And, uh, but I think it's been completely overshadowed by, by Mandela, and, uh, but that seems to be a kind of perpetuating cycle in the ANC, where the Youth League determines the pace. Mandela was later also. Uh, Okay, he was a much bigger, larger, mythical figure, but he was also under pressure from the youth, and that that actually emerged more pertinently under Mbeki and and, uh, and and Zuma. So I think I think there's a cycle there, but uh, I can only agree with you that uh, he he was a uh, he was an intellectual force as well as a very good organizer. I wonder, I mean, it's, that is so, so true. I mean, talking about his intellectual inputs. So in 1941, um, the Second World War is drawing to an end. Roosevelt and Churchill, they meet and they draw up these principles. Out of these principles, I think there were 11 or 12 principles, they are trying to envisage what kind of a world order will be established after the end of the war, what would replace the fascism of the Nazi party in Germany? One of the first principles is uh, self-determination. All countries must self-determine. All peoples, rather, not countries. All peoples must self-determine. This spreads across, and this document was called the Atlantic Charter. It is the precursor to the Universal Declaration on Human Rights, which obviously comes in 45. But in 1943, Kuma picks up the Atlantic Charter and then he raises the critical question. How can you talk about self-determination in the context where the whole of Africa is occupied, as it had been occupied since 1884 and 1885? He raises the point directly with smarts. Everyone loves smarts. But he was a racist for real, like a true, true racist. He raises the point with smarts. How can you talk about self-determination in Europe when your own people here in South Africa are living under conditions of subjugation? Will the principles of the Atlantic Charter apply to the native population? Smarts responds to him and says, do not ask me about ideas that are widely impractical and dismisses him and goes to join the Europeans. 1943, the ANC, under the leadership of Tuma, already sets out a Bill of Rights. What we see in the Universal Declaration on Human Rights is already decided here, virtually principle by principle, by among others, uh, Uma, as the spirit behind that movement. And that's why I agree with you that in terms of his intellectual force, we have completely overlooked him. And the story of the youth is actually true, because just by the sheer use of force, they were able to push the leaders that they wanted. Because obviously they didn't want Uma. Uma was ultimately pushed out of the ANC in uh, 1949. And pushed also out of the NEC, not only from the presidency. He was pushed out of the NEC and then replaced by Mandela, who had not been present at the, at the 49 conference. But he is someone I really think we should reconsider 
reimagine his ideas and put him in his proper historical place. Um, Emma, would you? Yeah, I think first of all, I think I, you need to explain the title. Uh, I tried to find it in the book uh, justification, but it's a very nice title, but I would like to know how do you tie it to the history? I'll show you where it is because it's a long, long time since you read the manuscript <laughs> and uh, gave me those wonderful um, comments. Um, I think, yes, it is page 187. Oh. It is, it comes from uh, I think it's page 187, 188. So this is a specific quote uh, from one of the protagonists. So essentially, Seme was running a case in, um, in Swaziland. And there was a meeting held on the 7th of March, 1908 among the Swazis, and this was presided over by a chief called Chief Malunga. And, I mean, there's a basic story told about the loss of land in Swaziland in, the, in this book, which is basically a concession system. And so unlike here, where there was just conquest and then people being pushed out, there was a concession system, a series of agreements, and there was a dispute about the validity of those concessions. And the Swazis met to discuss what to do with the concessions. And they wanted a meeting with the colonial uh, government, with a man called George Gray, actually, not Sir George Gray, but another George Gray. He then refused them a meeting, and then they tried to seek permission to go to London to petition. He refused them that permission too. And yet there was a law that said no one could be refused a uh, petition to London. And, then, and so uh, Malunga then makes the point at the meeting, and then he says, we know this is being done to us because we are black. We do not care because the land is ours. I, uh, the interesting conversation with Johan Froneman, who is a constitutional uh, court judge, uh, he's a Stella Wars alumnus, and uh, he came here and he sat here at Stias, and I said to him, the Land Act is going to come before you at, once, at some time in the future. I was predicting it two years before it happened, you know. And I sit there and I told him about what I had written about the frontier, you know, Afrikaner frontiers, you know. Uh, and that, you know, that you had a system of sharing uh, on, on a half, you know, that they, you, you get some... This is how people, the, the, the Afrikaner farmers in the 18th and 19th century got their labor. Come and live on my farm, and then we will farm on the half. And uh, that became a very extensive system, which was then totally disrupted by the Land Act of 1930. And uh, Jan Frohnemann gave a, a lecture at the end of his studies here after I told him to read for Hansen and to read my piece on the frontier. And he said with a straight face, The problem with South Africa is that the British came too late. <laughs> Meaning the British with their notion of exclusive individual property yeah. right. You know, the the Afrikaners had a much more broader conception that everyone could could be on the land and everyone uh, on it, my my wife's uh, grandfather uh, that even at in the nineteen thirties forties he was still talking about that part is as out of poor's land, you know, that's where he could sell and so on, you know. And there was even some evidence in the rebellion of 1914 that the farmers were unhappy because this right to have tenant farmers, you know, that was taken away from them. What struck me is really of how South Africa, the way in which you talk about the slaughter of the slaughtering of the Corsa in the, in, the, in the last frontier war, the slaughtering of the Zulus in the Bambata rebellion, is that I'm utterly convinced that the Afrikaners by their own couldn't conquer this country. They couldn't get to control the country. Without the British troops, South Africa wouldn't have been in the state it was in 1910. <laughs> Look, I mean, this is not an exculpation of what uh, happened after 1948, because, I mean, apartheid was declared a crime against humanity. But let's look back 
I mean, a, a hundred years, maybe 50 years, not even a hundred years before apartheid. So the fundamentals of racial segregation were not decided by the Africaners, they were decided by the British. And let's take the Eastern Frontier, which is what I have studied. If you went there in 1813, forget about 1913, if you went there in 1813, at the time of the expulsion of the Kosa from the Zurberg and the Zurfeld, yeah. what you would have found is that there had been a system of shared land allocation between the Afrikaners, the Kosas, and the Khoi Khoi. There had been several spasms of conflict, but they ultimately resulted in a shared system. You live here, but the poor farmers still kept Tosa slaves and Khoi slaves. But as far as native title was concerned, Dambe, Nuika, Imiting, they all had identified pieces of land. A man called John Graham, after whom the town of Grahamstown is named, came to South Africa in 1812 with the mandate of another man called John Cradock and another one, the secretary of the colonies, called Liverpool, with a specific mandate to expel the Kossas yeah. from the Zurfeld. This is the so-called Fourth and Fifth Frontier Wars. Maybe not as brutal as the Sixth and the Seventh, but equally effective in the complete displacement of the Tosas. The Zurfeld and the Zurpeg, for those who are not familiar with the Eastern Frontier, is what you call today Port Elizabeth, Port Alfred, Grahamstown. If you came here in 1813, those would have been Tosa and African lands. So the cleansing, in fact they called it extermination, the extermination of the Tosa was a specific instruction by the British. And that pushed them across to where they were by 1878, which was in the Transkai. And even if you added Sir Harry Smith, Sir George Gray, and then the later ones, because what the British were able to do is to send an army. But the interesting thing is that the Cape Regiment, because the, because uh, 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 John Graham used the Cape Regiment. It comprised of uh, a Boer army, I think about 150 people that were part and parcel of the Boer army. And it also comprised about 800 Khoi Khoi armies. But they were all commanded, or commandeered rather, from the British. So the idea of a proper colonial conquest is a uniquely British idea. One of the things I try to explain in my book is we should understand the fundamentals of racial segregation as ultimately an English idea or a British mm -hmm. idea. Whether you go to the Eastern Cape or you go to uh, the Western Cape, I mean the Western Cape here, 1900, 1901, that's when they passed the regulation that specifically compels the establishment of Kwanda Bay, the very first black settlement area using this nonsensical excuse of the, uh, of the diseases. So the cleansing of the cities and the establishment of what we today call petty apartheid was clearly British, I mean, historically speaking. Now you are asking a counterfactual question which is very, very difficult from a historical perspective to answer. What would the Africaners have done? Would they have exterminated the Kossos in the Eastern Cape? I think this yes, part of the problem is that if you look, if you came in 1813 and you look at whether, because they tried the war and they had not succeeded. They couldn't defeat the court they couldn't defeat the Germans. Yes, and they had simply not succeeded. Mm. The problem of course is that Herzog was a very effective mobilizer, but he comes very late in the process. Mm. And then by the time that he consolidates and then he is able to win 1948, yeah. at that point the picture has changed. So I think that if you look at their own social mindset, they obviously would have loved to conquer, mm. but they were objectively unable to do so. Yeah. And it was the British that ultimately drove the story to completion. Yeah. Everyone tries to, not everyone, I mean, frequent attempts of people to write the African story, and I also try to some extent. But no one wants to write the history of the English-speaking white people of South Africa. What Pacific was their role in the making of South Africa? 
I mean, they've got a wonderful ability to engage in the disappearing trick, you know. They, <laughs> they, they, you see them, see them now, and then so it's a wonderful uh, te television documentary. I think it's called Now That Jeremy Paxman, the Lex, left wing British journalist, he gave a television series with the name of Empire. And that right at the end, he said, the British has this canny ability to completely forget about the Empire. Well, he said, these Victorians, who were they? Very strange people. <laughs> You know, and somehow we all Afrikaners, we all have to, all the time have to grapple with our past, you know, what is, since of our forefathers and so on. And the English just floats above it all, you know. <laughs> Look, I mean, when we talk the past again, we, we've got to put context. The problem with the Afrikaners is that they must account for apartheid. And so there is just no way of getting around that. You, the, the reason you have to be held accountable is the sins of apartheid. No, I'm, I'm all for being held accountable for the Afrikaner community. I'm talking about the held accountable in the case of the English speaking people. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I agree with you. I mean, I'm so critical of the English, and I, I don't like this idea of sort of history starting in 1948. I think that the story of racial segregation needs to be told from a larger historical context. But I, I don't want to whitewash, I mean, uh, excuse the pun, I don't want to whitewash the sins of apartheid. <laughs> Shall we open it up for questions? Come <laughs> on. Uh, one question, linking into that one. How should we, how should we account? Uh, yeah, we at the moment. Yeah, I think Herman must answer how... how we, uh, the, the, uh, to be accountable, how should we account? Who is the we that you're talking about? The Afrikaners. Afrikaners. Mm. The Afrikaners. I'm, I'm not asking you. I'm asking, asking the author. Oh, okay. oh, how should okay. you're, not asking, you're not asking me. No, no, I'm asking the author. How should we <laughs> account? <laughs> okay. All right, I can give you a number of uh, ways of uh, accounting for the past. Uh, I mean, when you call the past, I mean, I, I complain strongly about apartheid in sp specifically, and not the larger past. So, firstly, uh, redistribution of land. That is the way of accounting. Uh, secondly, I've not heard any of the, you know, apartheid was declared a crime against humanity. None of the African leaders, Herman interviewed them and they wrote a beautiful book. None of them has ever said, I am sorry for apartheid. <coughs> not a single one of them. Huh? Well, I've been declared at the TRC under compulsion. Yeah. And then he says, I'm sorry if you are hurt by apartheid. Yeah. So this is uh, a qualified conditional apology. Th thirdly, we have to build a country. Yeah. This is the fundamental problem. We have to build a country. I think everyone individually, it is so easy, and this is actually the serious answer to what I've said before, it is so easy to think in collective terms. And because nothing has been done on a collective level, you tend to then avoid individual responsibility. My main concern about what we have not been able to do in South Africa is that we have not been able to take personal responsibility, personal accountability, to think about every day what you are doing to perpetuate apartheid mentality, what you are doing to perpetuate racism, what you can do to get things moving in the right direction in the country. There are so many basic things that can be done on an individual level. Beyond the abstract collective notion, what we should, as the Africaners, do, instead of asking, what should I do? As soon as you ask yourself what I should do as a South African, not as a, someone who belongs in some kind of a class or racial category, what should I do as a South African to make sure that the country I live behind is not the same country that I found? There is so much that we can do. One of the things I've been amazed about writing this book is how much the lawyers that I've covered in the book thought individually what they thought the country should look like when they decided actually. It is senseless to think of ourselves in racial categories. We should start thinking of ourselves as South Africans. If you ask yourself as a South African, what is my responsibility, what have I done in order to make this country a better country for all of us? Take another example, which is, I find exasperating. The denialism of apartheid. Mm. 
The fact that today somebody told me I bought my farm, without explaining that it is a, an acquisition that takes place in the context of subjugation. I asked Absa the other day, why do you continue benefiting from an immoral system of labor tenancy? Why don't you, that portion of labor tenancy, why don't you give that to the country? I asked Agri SA the other day, why don't you give the portions of the farms among your members that are occupied by workers? Why don't you give that to the workers and ask the government to register in their name? So once we start thinking practically, there are many things. The problem is the paradigm. It is the mind shift. And this is what you and I need to think about. How should we make the country a better country? The fact is, Africaners are going nowhere. The English who live in this country are going nowhere. Black people are going nowhere. We are going back to the source, to where we started. We have to make the country work. And I think to make the country work means you should think every day, what am I doing to make things worse? And what can I do to make things better for the country? So when I call for accountability, I don't care about Nazi style, Nuremberg style accountability. But I'm concerned not about the past, I'm concerned about the future. Are we going to live a better country than we found? Sorry, just, uh, just, I think we start uh, closing down. Yes, um, the expropriation without compensation. I think you're on record as saying that it is actually not necessary to have new legislation. It's covered by, covered by Article 25 of the Constitution. So what is the purpose of the exercise? Well, I mean, it depends on which perspective you're coming from in relation to this debate. I think the exercise of the Absolutely. parliamentary process, yeah, the current ex exercise, I think it is an utterly pointless exercise. Because the problems with Section 25 have nothing to do with the text of the Constitution. The problem have everything to do, I've identified three, and these are all written in several articles I've published in the Mail and Guardian, and I've been interviewed, I think, by a report. The problem is not Section 25. The problem is that, firstly, in the process of land reform, there's massive corruption. And the corruption doesn't come from the government alone. It comes from landowners who artificially push up property prices as soon as they know that the property is subject to an expropriation. And they are working in cahoots with land claimants and government bureaucrats. The clearest example of corruption is the case of Malamala, where everybody, all of the expert property valuers, ultimately value the property at about 700 million and below. The government decides to sell it for a billion. We haven't asked what happened to that 300 million. And that is the amount left for corruption. I did a case when I was an acting judge in the Land Claims Court where the valuers came up to 40 million rands, but there was a section 42 claim that I had to endorse under, under the Restitution Act. I, it had to be endorsed by the Land Claims Court. And that section 42 agreement put the price, not the value, the price at 89 million rands which I rejected, said, but why am I endorsing 89 million rands when every vendor says it's 40, it's 40 million rands? What's going to happen to the 49 million rands? And that, again, is what we are paying for corruption. The second problem has been our own failure to understand the constitutional requirement of just and equitable compensation. Every landowner wants market value and above, but we all have Section 25, which says just and equitable compensation. And we've never grappled with the meaning of just and equitable compensation. In a judgment that I gave in 2016, which was criticized, by the way, by AgriSA, I think now they, they probably believe they should not have criticized my judgment because it was a fairly moderate judgment. But in a judgment I gave in uh, 2016, I ruled that the text of Section 25 requires compensation as a general principle, but it doesn't require market-related compensation. And therefore, each compensation that is paid must take into account several factors, history, investment, etc. And I reduced the amount 
to below the market value. It went to the Supreme Court of Appeal, they decided to take the money back to market value. And I think if they now look at what's going on, it's the consequence. And then the third problem we've had with the problem of Section 25, I believe it's just a general misunderstanding. Because what the government did after 1994, it adopted a policy which has no constitutional foundation of willing seller, willing buyer. It's been implementing willing seller, willing buyer on its own, without any compulsion. Now I asked the Minister of uh, Land Affairs, the new minister, uh, about three weeks ago, how much money have you paid as the government for land reform since 94? She said 54 billion rands. I asked, where has the money gone? Because you've, we've only got 4%, according to Ben Cousins, 4% of uh, farms have been restituted. So I asked, where did the 54 billion rands go? She then says, well, the money has gone to land owners and then some of it to land claimants, but the bulk of it has gone to land owners. I said, this is exactly the problem. You have spent 54 billion rands, but you cannot show what we have achieved for it. So the point I have been making is that the problem with Section 25 has nothing to do with the Constitution. It has everything to do with the enforcement. And since I'm in a session with historians, in 1996, when the Constitution was adopted, the DP opposed Section 25. Today, they are the champions of Section 25. 